Welcome to another episode of the Press Box. I'm your host, Brent Terry Next to me, I got Peter Betcher, and right across from us, we have Mary Genrich and Nick Fernbaugh. Um, guys, how are you? How are y'all doing today? I'm good. I'm excited for the men's soccer game tonight, and uh, I'm super pumped that we have finally college basketball and the NBA going on at the same time. <laughs> same time. <sighs> yeah, I would say I'm also excited for the soccer game. I already see like everything set up on Rooney. I'm just really looking forward to it. I mean, between soccer, basketball, you got the NFL still firing all cylinders. I think it's almost as good a time as ever to be a sports fan. I mean, we're in, we're in the month of November, as you said, Nick. I mean, this is the best time to be a sports fan just because the idea there's just so much going on. I mean, this was the only month that, is it? The, yeah, it was the only month that all four big four professional sports teams play, and that was just yeah. wonderful. The MLB's done because the Astros defeated the Phillies 4-2 in the series, and that's going to be our first topic today. So we got two Phillies fans I know right here. Yeah, I'm mean, for October because Pirates are just, they're a pain. Yeah, I do not want to talk about the <laughs> Pirates at all. The fact that you even brought that up just that made just me a little bit up upset. I know. For every Pittsburgh I, know. Fan. Yeah. I have a Phillies hat, so I, I didn't mind the Phillies, yeah, though. Yeah. But the first topic, uh, we'll talk about the Phillies. Um, they were up 2-1 at home. Yeah. And then game four happened. Combined no-hitter. And that in my opinion, change the momentum of the series. So, Nick, as a true Phillies fan, I want to hear your take on the whole You're, series. I mean, you hit it right on the head. I mean, it's also painful because I think they talked about it. Like, it was like the second time in like 50 years a team got no hit in the World Series, something like that. Makes sense because also the last time a team threw a no-hitter in the playoffs was 2010, Roy Halladay's no-hitter against the Reds. It, it's just irony all the way around. But, I mean, the Astros... I mean, they deserved to win it all the way. Even though we blew them out in game three, they were the team that was, like, stacked from top to bottom. If it wasn't the Dodgers that were one of the top contenders for the World Series, it was the Astros. And it pains me, uh, especially because after the season, they've, they turned down Gene Segura, which basically means he's going to free agency, and he's probably not going to come back, most likely. And <laughs> Zach Eflin declined like his, it was like a mutual option for next year, which I think he's gonna get paid like twenty million or something like that, fifteen twenty million. So, I think overall, I think they're making the right decisions going about the off season, but it still hurts at the end of the day. They were close, and I just felt like they couldn't get the momentum back after the no hitter. I mean, Zach said it himself, the no hitter really just slowed Philadelphia's momentum down, and. Uh, I mean, as much as I wanted the Phillies to win a World Series after a no-hitter, uh, after that just big loss, you just really can't regain that, especially when you're going, uh, I think they were going away after that, right? So. What, after game four or five? Uh, after a no-hitter. I believe no, they, they had one more game at home. They lost a close game 3-2. It was a, basically a bullpen game for Philly. Then they went back, had a chance in game six. Yeah, they were up on nothing. They yeah. yanked Zach Wheeler in favor for Alvarado, who had lights out through most of the postseason until the last two games against Houston were, or actually all three, game two, th or game four, five, and six, he did not pitch great. So it was just one of those things where I think the Magic just kind of ran out the worst possible moment. I mean, I guess it does suck for you guys, but just the idea that you guys went into um, November knowing that your baseball team still had a shot like, that's pretty cool. Can't hang our heads too sad. It was a good yeah. season all the way through. I mean, well, I wish Mike. my team, the Pirates, well, yeah, any good. Our team. Yeah. Any yeah. Likes. Our that's, team. Our team, yeah. Yeah, we haven't been good since 2014. Okay, but Nick, seriously, though, in the future, do you think the Phillies can make a deep run like this again and back in the postseason? It's definitely going to depend on a lot of things. One, they got a lot of young pitching that might be coming up in the next two, year or two from Mick Abel to Griff McGarry to Andrew Painter, who's Andrew Painter looks amazing. He might be on the rotation next year. And a big, a big thing that's going to depend on is if they can replace what Gene Segura is going to bring to this team next year. They're looking at Bogarts, probably Turner, um, Correa, one of the big shortstops to try and plug the hole there because they're going to, most from what I've seen, they're going to try and move Bryson Stott, who's been an unbelievable rookie this year, over to second and plug the hole where Gene Segura is going to be there. So it's going to depend on if they can get their hands on a big shortstop. It's going to be a big thing. And replacing the depth at the back end of the rotation. I think they got the team to be good for the years to come. It's just going to depend on if they can get the valuable pieces in the offseason. I mean, I think they'll be okay. I don't know if they'll make the World Series again next year, but I think they definitely will make the postseason. But something else that's going to help this team in the future, whether um, 
other teams like it or not is the idea that they're fan base, man. Philly's fan base, like it's what you what you call it, Red October? Is that what you call Red October? Yeah, October hundred yep. percent, dude. Like that was insane. Just seeing the atmosphere on television, man, dude. I it, wish I was in Philly just to go to one of those games. It was insane. We were. I was looking at getting tickets, but one they were like a few grand too. Like they were consistently saying the place was rocking around ninety decibels through most of the game, and if you sit in an environment like that for that long, your ears are going to be feeling it the next day. That's a this is a fact. But it's a once in a lifetime experience. That was crazy. Good for your good for you guys anyway. All right. So the next topic I want to discuss is we're going to switch over and talk about the NFL. Um, all of us here have favorite NFL teams, but the first team I want to talk about is Mary's Buffalo Bills. Cannot believe you're a Bills fan. Um, they had a shock and loss this past week against the New York Jets, Mary, in Week 9. Even with the loss, the Bills are still number one in the AFC. Jets are for real. This is a good team. So, Mary, my question for you involving them is, um, do you think this team can still win the division? Yes, because Josh Allen said himself that he just played like shit that game and that um, it's hard to win <laughs> like a game in the NFL when your quarterback doesn't do well, and he said it himself. Um... But I think a big difference that it made, I know they play the Jets again later in the season, but it's going to be at Orchard Park, which I think is going to be a big difference maker for them. But, yeah, I definitely see them still winning the AFC. But we also have to take into account that Josh Allen might be hurt. Uh, Sean McDermott said that we'll see if he plays on Sunday, and that is a huge, that would be a huge loss to not have him and that right now he's going on a day-to-day -day basis with his elbow. Yeah. I mean, before I, I want to hear what you have to say, Nick, before you go, I just want to say that Bills playing at home is just so much, the way they play at home is just so much different. As I said before with the Phillies, just that home crowd, home atmosphere, I mean, it can really um, yeah. help, help and boost the team up so much. I mean, th their two losses, as you said, were both on the road at the Jets, at the Dolphins. So, I mean, they've showed so far that they can win at home. They had that good, impressive win against the Chiefs, Chiefs on oh, the yeah. road, too, and that atmosphere that is always crazy, too. But, but yeah. Nick, what do you think about the Bills? Well, for one, I mean, you, you brought it up with the Phillies. I mean, the Bills Mafia might be one of the best fan bases. Honestly, this is coming from a Seahawks fan. <laughs> Bills Mafia <laughs> might be one of the coolest fan bases ever. But um, first, who are they playing next week, if anyone knows? Up They're playing, playing the Vikings. Vikings. Steph playing the Vikings. That's, Stephon, a, big that's a big game. game for Stephon Diggs. 100%. Oh, that's also very true. The biggest thing I think that's hurting Buffalo right now, one, I mean, in the game against the Jets, Josh Allen threw two ugly interceptions. I mean, one, he just completely just missed the pass that Sauce Gardner just picked it off himself. The other one, I'm pretty sure he threw in the, like, double coverage or something. It was a pass he just needed to just throw away, and he just threw it into a bad spot. So he's, I mean, he's, it, I think I talked about it. It was the first game he had multiple turnovers since week four of 2019. He threw three picks against the Patriots. He's not done that since then. So I think that's more of a testament to how insane Josh Allen has become. So his loss is definitely going to be, would be big if they didn't have it. I think the other big issue for the Bills, and I don't think this will fully affect it unless Josh Allen misses time, their run game really hasn't done much of it. Anything Singletary is still like the starting running back, right? Singletary, yeah, he's still the starting running back overall. But between him, they traded for Naeem Hines from the Colts, who's a big playmaker, hasn't really done much of anything there. And then James Cook, they got in like third or fourth round from Georgia, a guy who was projected to be a big playmaker as a running back. They just haven't been able to get those guys really going. And for having that many like kind of depth running backs who can provide quality, they really haven't effectively used it. And I don't know if it's more because their game plan revolves around like the receivers like Dawson Knox, Stephon Diggs, Gabriel Davis, guys like that, or if it's more along the lines of... And Isaiah McKenzie. Oh, yeah, and, and McKenzie, yeah. Or if it's just like something with the scheme is just not working with their running backs. But I think if they were able to... If one of those three were able to step up, I think the Bills' offense would explode. They would be almost unbeatable. They'd easily be the best team in the AFC. But I think it's just been the one thing that's consistently just been holding them back over the last few years. What do you think about Bill's Mafia? Well, I think about Bill's Mafia is that they're, like what Zach said, greatest fan, one of the greatest fan bases in, uh, in the United States and sports market. Uh, I mean, our, obviously it's going to be arguable against Phillies fans because as a Sixers fan, they get really rowdy and they could, uh, you know, 
say some things that aren't really classy, but uh, <laughs> we don't break tables. So um, I think for the Bills, uh, they ran to the Jets, who have won some games against, what was it, the Packers. Yeah, the Jets are for real. Yeah, the Jets are Just not. Keep talking, and I'm going to tell you why the Jets are a team you should all watch out for. Sauce Gardner. I mean, he's obviously one of the good defensive players right now in the league. Apparently, um, good at, he's apparently good at Call of Duty, too. Yeah, <laughs> apparently, but is he better than uh, Kyle Murray? <laughs> I've never watched. I've never watched Kyle Murray. Oh, look, all I'm saying is, I've, I've seen. I've actually like took ten minutes to watch Sauce Gardner play Call of Duty. He's not that bad. And the real question. <laughs> I'm just wondering if Sauce Gardner also can get a. Uh, didn't Kyle Murray get like something in his contract for Call of Duty? Like if he doesn't play, he gets like more money. It's like a homework clause or something. Yeah, something like it's it's he crazy. Got his contract. I remember because I laughed as a, as a fan just seeing that. Yeah, it was so funny just seeing the homework clause they put in the like in there because it just basically called him out as lazy, which is wild. <laughs> yeah, but look, um, the AFC East is obviously going to be a very contentious. Uh, co- uh, what, would it, what would it be? It's not conference. It's going to be division. Region? Division. Yeah. Um, my bad. Um, but no. <laughs> yeah, look, um, the Jets and the Dolphins have the same record of six and three right now, and we haven't been talking about the Dolphins at all yet. And Tyreek Hill has been a good piece for them, and. Look, the Bills are obviously going to have like not a perfect season. They're not the Dolphins in, what was it, 1973? Or the Carolina Panthers in 2015, 2016 that went 15-1? Yeah, 15-1, yeah. right? Yeah. The Patriots um, that went to the Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah they were like 16. Yeah. 16, was, no, regular season. They won the two playoff games, lost in the Super Bowl. To the Giants. To that yeah, helmet cash bio. Yeah. was his name, David, David Tyree. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, look, I'm, I'm expecting the Bills to make it through the AFC and win the AFC. Um... It's just a safe bet, but look with uh, Stefan Diggs and uh, Josh Allen leading the offense, it's going to be an unstoppable duo, and they've been proving that with their six and two record. Sure, like you could say, oh, but the Jets beat them. Like, show me when the playoff starts. Like, who's going to be there and who's going to show up and have a good game? Because I'm pretty sure Josh Allen's going to show up for any playoff game. I agree with that. I'm saying is that this AFC East just got a whole lot more interesting mm-hmm. just yeah. as the as this week has um progressed and just the way that I've seen these Dolphins and Jets play. I mean, I mean you look even at the, the Patriots. Even, even the Patriots too, yeah. Cuz they shut out they shut out the Colts once again. They made Sam Ellinger look like another rookie. I mean, Bill Belichick always destroys rookies and to go along with it. I mean, and yeah, the offense didn't do a ton, but when you get 9 sacks on a QB, I like think they're having PTSD for the next few weeks. That's all I'm going to say. I mean, the Jets are surprising, and Peter, as you said about these Dolphins, I mean, when Tua's, like, mind's in the right place and when he can actually, like, and know what's going on and not have a concussion, Ugh. dude, he's dangerous. Like, him and Tyreek Hill and uh, Jalen Waddle, mm. they're just, like, it's not even funny. Tyreek and Hill's on Sick pace for 2,000 yards. That's, you say Hill? Hill's on pace for 2,000 yards, if not more. He's had five games with over 140 yards, and it's week nine. You let that sink in for how wild that is. I mean, yeah. you think about some of the comebacks they've had, too. I mean, being the Bills at home was impressive. I mean, they were down against the Ravens in, like, week two. Yeah. Dude, they were down by, like, 20. 21 at, yeah. like, the third quarter or something. Came yeah. back, won that. Um, I mean, their losses, I mean, they were against the Jets and the Bengals. I mean, but besides that, they really – and the Dalt Vikings, too. But yeah. Yeah, they just taking care of business, I guess. AFC is part. going to be a very – like watchable division, especially with since they're the only division with all four teams having a winning record. Sure. Yeah, so you got most divisions will rock in three teams without a winning record. I think or the, the NFC South that has no, no team, no with, team with, with a winning record. record. That's, that's wild. Yeah. yeah. I mean, usually you have like two teams in each division <laughs> with a winning record, right? I know the most, I know the AFC yeah. North has like two winning teams right now, and that's the Ravens and the Bengals, and the Steelers. I'm just. I'm not even going to talk about I don't even see what's going on. Every fan wants to just put a bag over their head this season. Yeah, so this season, yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, I guess so the next topic I, I want to talk about today is um, let's talk about, talk about your Seahawks, Nick. I mean, I don't know what you thought heading into the season, but they are 6-3 and three right now. Top three draft picks, simple as that. No, there's, it's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And it's not to bash on Geno Smith because he's been amazing this season and Last week's this this last win just proved like, it really proves how underrated he's been all season because uh, he he had that awful pick six he just lobbed up a screen pass that was terrible those 
and Zayvon Collins for uh, Arizona just picked it off and ran it back all the way. It was a horrible play. And as soon as he did that, he went 10 for 12, had a touchdown. I mean, he was efficient. He was completing passes. He has the highest completion percentage of any quarterback in the NFL. Still? Like 74% or something like that. It's insane to me when I saw that. And it's a testament to how good this team is. And when I came this season, no. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't tell me at the start of the season this team would be winning the division. There was no way between the fact that their offense has been a top five unit in the league. Their defense over the last four weeks is averaging only 18 points a game, which is, is sixth in the NFL. That's insane to me. Especially in, over the first five weeks, they were averaging like 30 points on defense, which was worst in the NFL. To have that much of a turnaround, the, I, I don't feel like you could tell me at the start of the season with any confidence. You see, once uh, I'm just going to relate this to my Steelers. Like when I thought Ben Roethlisberger left, and I, if Kenny Pickett or um, what's his name, Mitch Trubisky, if we were like six and three, like I would be having the same like, oh my goodness, like this is like amazing right now. But that's not the case for me. So I definitely understand how you feel because I wish I was in. Um, it's just a lot. There's just a lot of mid in the NFL right now. Position. <laughs> All right, a lot so of them, dude. do you think, okay, so they got Tampa Bay next week, and then, I mean, I look at the rest of their schedule. You mean schedule. that dumb game in Munich? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like the first game ever in, like, Germany or something. Yeah, I'm not looking forward to that. <laughs> well, waking up at 9.30 in the morning? More like, probably missing it until when I wake up at, like, 11, because <laughs> of events on Saturdays, but, um, <laughs> no, more along the lines of it's just, you I've never been a fan of playing games overseas, it messes up your time, messes up your mental clock, it, it's all these things, but I mean, it's going to be a big game. Technically, right now, as bad as Tampa is, they're first, so they got to they gotta take care of business against yeah. a team that should be, as bad as they are, they can still be feisty, they can be a pest, and you can't ever, you can't ever count Tom Brady out, no matter what the situation is. It's a good thing they're like 6-3, and because you look at the rest of their schedule, do you think, Nick, that this Seahawks team can still be on top once the regular season ends in the division? Look at the schedule like on your phone. The biggest thing for me is can they play good against the Niners? Because week two, they hurt Trey Lance. He got knocked out of the game early and then got destroyed by Jimmy G. My, I don't even remember if Debo was playing that game. I, don't, I think he was. But the fact of the matter is by the time they go back to play, which is week 15, when they go and play San Fran again, they're going to have Debo back. They're going to have CMC. They got Kittle, Ayuk. I mean, they got a nasty offensive unit in a solid defense to boot with Fred Warner just manning everything and just leading the entire defense. It's going to be tough. I mean, they got to play good against the Rams, who have been bad. They got the Chiefs. They didn't even realize that until I looked. They have the Jets, who I thought at the start of the year would be a big game to win. <laughs> yeah, it is now. Didn't think they'd actually be as good as they are now. But, um, no, it's going to... They got a lot of easy games in between. I mean, the Bucks haven't been good. The Rams have struggled immensely this season. The Raiders have been Carolina a complete mess. Easy Carolina's a, also a mess. Mm -hmm. Like, they should take care of business. They're probably going to lose a game there knowing it. Knowing it, it's going to be Carolina. Um, <laughs> just how things usually go. But if they're playing as good as they are, they should make it. It's just going to depend on a few games. And for me, I think the biggest ones for me is the Niners game and the Bucks game. They got to win that game in Germany, and they got to beat San Fran. They've always had issues with San Fran, and it, they got to figure it out. It's a good rivalry. It Tell is. It's not as good as Rams Niners, but pretty good. I mean, the Rams. I mean, they're not great. It should, should, should be Tampa. Then get the job done. They let Tom Brady. That game was awful. Let Tom Brady go down. I know. Oh God. If I'm you so had any players on your field. fantasy team in that game, it was probably like. Probably just disgusting. Oh, my, dad had God, my dad had Godwin and um, probably cried a lot and <laughs> internally. That's funny. All right, now let's just switch over to NBA real quick. Um, I haven't been paying much attention to the NBA, but Peter, I'm just going to yep, have you spiel real quick yep. about your Philadelphia 76ers. I <laughs> mean, I, are, they, are they good right now? I mean, uh, take, take it away. My they, played, they played Phoenix uh, two days ago because they didn't have election uh, games on election night. Um, and Jordan Nian shot seven from ten from the three-point line, and Joel Embiid had a thirty-point uh, double double, I believe, against the Suns. And the Suns are obviously going to be a contender for the NBA because um, they've been uh, contending for the past two seasons, I believe. 
Um, and look, it's just good to see that the Sixers are showing up against teams that are going to contend for the NBA Finals, especially with the Phoenix Suns being in the competitive West that they are in now. Um, granted, the Sixers are 5-6 and six right now, um, and you could just say that they lost to the Suns, and or they lost to the Spurs, they lost to um, a couple other teams, they lost to the Knicks, they lost to the Wizards, Raptors. but they also beat mm -hmm. the Wizards too, yeah. Um, it's just, and then they have a two-game uh, series against the Hawks. One's going to be at Atlanta, and the other's going to be back in Philly. And I'm looking forward for both of those games, especially since Atlanta has been mainly in the, among the consensus of all the media going to be in the top six, top five when it comes to playoff seating. So I want to see how that rolls out, um, especially since uh, DeJounte Murray had a 20-point double-double um, recently. I think that was against the Bucks, and the Bucks are off, like mainly – uh, number one or two in a lot of uh, picks for NBA seeding, especially with the, yeah, whatever, uh, <laughs> with Giannis Antetokounmpo and Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday being one of the elite front, uh, just lineups in general in the NBA. So um, just, I'm really like ready to see how they the uh, Sixers perform against the Hawks, uh, I guess, in their next game tomorrow. So Five and six, I mean, too early. Yeah, but especially in the 82 game season. Same yeah, thing with my playing. Penguins. Too early, but like when you lose like seven in a row and they play Washington nights, like I don't yeah, know. Got, Washington's not great, but Kraken fan here, we're happy, we're we're smiling a little bit. What's your what you got? You guys won. You guys beat like Nashville yesterday. Yeah, we beat Nashville five one. <sighs> Put four on their head in the first period. Mm -hmm. You you guys like good this year? Don't know. I mean, Martin Jones standing on his head, which I wasn't expecting. Um, playing efficient. Again, our free agent signings of. Oliver Bjorkstrand and Andre Burakowski. I love Burakowski so much. Uh, already making immediate impact, so uh, feeling a little optimistic. The uh, I forget what, I forget if we're in the Pacific. Yes, you are. Like, the Pacific is not that good this year, <laughs> so feeling feeling a little optimistic to start the year. When you when you first heard that Seattle was getting an NHL team like two years ago. Or maybe, th yeah, it was definitely like three years ago. What was going through your mind? Like, the hockey was coming to Seattle? I was just excited because, like, I didn't really start, for reference, I didn't start watching hockey until the pandemic. So that was, like, the one thing I can actually thank the pandemic for because it helped me get more in the hockey because it just never was something that got, like, in, that was something I found interesting until I put the time and actually start watching games. Like, I, I live outside of D.C. I could have gone to crack, uh, uh, Capitals games all the time. Like, Ovi played through my whole childhood. Barely ever watched him play. Was he retired and now? No. Oh. No, he's still playing now. Okay. He's trying to chase after Gretzky's yeah, goal scoring record. record. Yeah. Mm. He just passed Bordy Howe, I think, like a day or two ago. Yeah, Wild is. You're right. Yeah. For like what points or whatever? Or yeah, goals. It, was, it was goals. It was goals. Okay. Yeah. But um, no, so when the Kraken got a hockey team, I was like, you know what? I'll use this time to like actually start watching hockey a little more in depth. So I mean, I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm enjoying it. I think they market themselves well is a big thing. I'm excited to see when they'll make the playoffs. Hopefully this year. <laughs> That'll be good. You bring hockey, bring playoff hockey back to Seattle. It's good they got hockey back in Seattle playoff hockey. I would love to see how the atmosphere would be like for that. Because oh. Seahawks, I mean, Seahawks games. Seattle sports has got to be, I mean, they're excited. Just wait for the Super Sox to come back. Dude, could you imagine they came back? The Sox are bound to come back before 2030, I think. 2030. I mean, okay. right now, I mean, if they were going to do it, now would probably be the time. Mariners just broke their playoff drought. Right. Mm -hmm. Kraken's looking solid. The Seahawks are defying every expectation under the sun. So Adam yeah. Silver, please bring back the Seattle Super Sox. I need Gary Payton to show up at a game, please. <laughs> <laughs> I, wore, I wore number 20 in high school because of Gary Payton, man. I love that guy. That's awesome. Yeah. That's funny. All right, so our next topic I want to talk about with all y'all is – um. The women's and men's basketball teams, uh, they couldn't have had any better start. I mean, the women's team defeated Point Park 94-47 on Monday. The men's team defeated Montana 91-63 on Tuesday. We all, I think we were all there at either one of the games. So, yeah. yep. um, Mary, I'm going to start with you. What do you think about um, both teams winning the season and home openers? I think it was really nice to see, um, especially since, like, the basketball teams, I know since I've been here, haven't been that great. Um, in the women's, 
uh, game, you could definitely tell Megan and Tess are the main girls. They're scoring a lot of the points and doing what they need to do. They were roommates, so they have like a really good connection. And then I know the men's team, they have a lot of new players, freshmen, transfers. And I didn't really see that many mistakes. And it looks like they have a bunch of great chemistry already. Peter, I just know, like, you're dying to, like, say stuff you about both those teams. freaking know it. Okay, I'll start with the men's team first. Um, obviously, like we said, uh, Mary said earlier, uh, there's some skeptics when it comes to the season. I'll be admitting that I was one of them. Um, like, last year you just saw a lot more of the team playing individually. Pretty well Spears having 30-point games, I think, twice last season. And not really, I think they're in the top, bottom five in all the NCAA when it comes to assists. Um, so it's good to see that men's basketball is playing as one cohesive unit. You could really see that at the bench having the energy of just supporting one another. Um, you can see that um, even the box score that they had 13 assists. Um, I believe that last season uh, men's basketball averaged five. Um, so it's good to see that they're having more than double the, their assist turnout. But um, one thing I would like to see is to lower their turnovers because they had uh, 13 t turnovers. So that turnover to assist ratio is one to one. Um, so you're going to have to look at that. But Day Day Grant having a perfect game of shooting like 100% across the board from three throws to the three point line and just in the field in general. Um, he's going to be a very interesting person to watch this season, especially coming from the Mid-American Conference, which isn't really regarded as a premier mid-major uh, mid conference with Ohio, Miami, Ohio, um, other teams in the Midwest. But I'm really excited to also see some of the freshmen, uh, Matus Ronsky going off, um, having a 13-point game. I'm really, really excited to see this guy because it looks like he has a very good IQ for the shots. Um, he shot 83% from the field last night, and um, he also showed that he has some defensive effort having two of steals. Um, so I'm just re really excited for this team uh, this, uh, this year. I mean, am I going to say that they're going to be top five in this conference? I won't say that yet. It's too early, 30-game um, se uh, season. But their next game's Kentucky. Um, that's going to be a major test for them, especially with them being a, going against a power six conference school and Kentucky, um, as what Dan Brown said in the press conference last night, um, being one of the premier college basketball teams in the nation. Um, it's up there with Duke, UNC, UCLA. Um, it's going to be a very interesting team to see um, how the, the Dukes handle. Um, so, I mean, what I liked from the men's team on Tuesday was the idea that they were playing a lot of press, and that's something that yeah. from um, since I've came to Duquesne in 2019 that they really haven't done that much. So seeing some of that yesterday, it was kind of new, different, and it obviously it was working. I mean, you saw the score, and that was pretty good. And for the women's team, I mean, you've got to beat it. You have to beat an NAIA school, and which is what they did in Point Park. So whooping them was important, and that's Ooh. what they did. Yeah. Oh yeah. So Nick, what do you think about uh, either game from as a fan perspective? I didn't see much about the women's game, but it, I mean, <clears throat> it's definitely a good thing to beat Point Park, and I think they they beat them by a lot. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, ninety four forty seven. Yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I said the women's basketball game, man. I mean, that's a, a I mean, that's game. a really good start to the season, getting a big win like that. And then for the men's, I mean, we we all knew the story from last season. They lost seventeen straight to end the season. They were six and seven before that happened. They were basically 500 before that happened. That's that, yeah. brutal. And to go out and be one, get a win finally, to like, give some confidence to like the players itself. And I mean, you said it best. I mean, they, they kind of played a lot. They played really soft last season. So I think getting more aggressive, getting more press, getting in their face more, I think it led to a lot more turnovers on their end. And you, you said it best, Day Day Grant, he was incredible. Absolutely. I think that's a fantastic get from Duquesne to get a guy like that who shot well. And just the whole team shot well. I mean, they shot yeah. like 42% at the three-point line. That's really good overall. And just they just looked like an overall more confident group. And if they can hold their own against Kentucky, who when I saw they're ranked number four in the country, that's 
that's going to say a lot <coughs> about what we got here. They can make yeah. it somewhat close. That would be impressive. Another thing I want to say about the men's team is just the idea that they beat Montana. And Montana has been known for years since, like, well, since I start really following college basketball in 2010, like the amount of tournament win, the amount of conference championships they had, and their uh, the amount of school. tournament appearances that they've had, pretty impressive. So that's a good way to boost your confidence, if any. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I thought <laughs> right. you had something more to say involved in that. I mean, I mean, go ahead, Mary. Um, what surprised me in the game yesterday is I would. I was going into the game thinking that I'd see more of Kevin easily, and he didn't get as much action as I thought he was going to. So that was one thing I took away. I agree. He had a lot of playing time last year, starter yeah. and all that. Mm -hmm. um, this team is a lot taller, too. Yeah, a lot mm -hmm. taller. It's good like, to see it that. Is Very like, tall. I, I did not pay much attention to their um, off-season transactions involving, like, transfers and uh, player freshman recruits. I mean, that was pretty... Like, that was pretty tall. I mean, Montana was, like, missing shots. And I don't, I don't want to say they're that bad, but I feel like the intimidation of, like, how tall we were had, it, like, influenced them a little, no matter if they want to admit it or not. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, compared to last year, we didn't have that much depth in the front court. And when Rotroff went down, that's when we had, like, very little defensive effort, in my opinion. Um, so it's good to see that we have good rebounders, good defenders in the front court uh, just to prevent – teams in the future to try to get into the paint or even the mid-range shots. We can have good defenders that could at least contest shots and make it difficult for them. Peter, I'm going to ask you this on camera because I ahead. literally just... Go ahead. Where did, all, where did all the players go from last year? I don't pay much attention to these transfers or where they all go. Like, where did where did Primo go? Where did Jack jo Johnson go? Where did... Ty I don't know if Tyson A. Cuff still has eligibility or not, but where did all these guys go? Primo Spears went to Georgetown. Toby O'Connor went to UIC. Uh... Tyson, Tyson Spears, you say Georgetown? Yeah. Yeah, he played against uh, Coppin State. I think that's how you say it. I don't care. Um, what did I say? Um, second one was Toby Akani at UIC. Um, Toby Akani, whoops. Tyson Acuff went to Eastern Michigan. Um, shoot. Leon Ayers went to Bowling Green. Who, and we got Joe Reese from Bowling Green, so it's a little bit of a trade. Um, what else? Um, Jackie Johnson, he went to UNLV. Um, I haven't been paying attention to the Mountain West Conference, um, but I need to see how they're doing. Um, yeah, I know that I, th I think Eastern Michigan probably plays tonight. Well, that they already played, but uh, I need to see how our transfer transfers are doing, I guess. Transferees. I, I know no the idea. They all went to all those is. schools, but yeah, um, it's helping. Yeah, and Mike Pekelja went to Kent State. Uh, same school that his uh, brother Sincere Carey goes. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, right. So yeah, makes yeah, sense yeah. there. Mm -hmm. All right, last and final topic I want to discuss with all of you guys today. Um, something I think we've all paid a lot of attention to, either taking pictures of the game, working men's soccer for Duquesne Athletic Productions, or just taking pictures. I mean, this team, Duquesne, plays Loyal Chicago t tonight in its semifinals matchup, and for Duquesne there, Blessed to have this game at home. I honestly also think this team was blessed that they were able to survive LaSalle. Didn't think that they deserved to win this game, but when, uh, when teams like LaSalle, like you make a mistake like that, you give and a team that's better than you an opportunity to capitalize, which they did on a penalty kick. And once your starting goalkeeper goes down, I mean... It's always going to be an uphill battle. Yep. Exactly. So, Mary, I want to hear what you have to say first on how you think the season's going. And um, what should we expect in tonight's game against Loyola Chicago? Um, so the last time they played Loyola Chicago, it was at home earlier this season. They beat them 2-1. Um, this last game against LaSalle, um, a player who really stood out to me, who hasn't played much at all this season, came off the bench, was Anthony Delfalco. I think he made an immediate impact from the time he stepped onto the field until he left and I think we'll see some action from him tonight as he played so well this past game. Yeah, for Anthony, a freshman from Franklin Regional, I mean, I, I did some research on him when he was in high school. Man was really balling at Franklin Regional and the idea that he was able to make an impact in some way physical and uh, he had some good passes along the line there. It's pretty good and impressive to me. Um, I mean, it worked from working it, I mean, 
<coughs> when they lost their goal, when they lost their goalie last night, I mean that was a big, or a few nights ago. It was. It definitely showed that they were going to be just struggling, and I appreciate sure they let a softy to go down. It was like something that I think they're probably their starter keeping would have definitely had, but I mean sometimes, like as shown by the Phillies, you just sometimes need a break every now and then. You just need a tiny bit of luck. That's how a lot of deep playoff runs are made. You need that little, you need that little spark. You need a, sometimes you just need a break or two to go your way, and. And that was the break they got, and they took advantage of it all the way through, which I think is also something saying. I mean, they the teamwork on their team is unmatched, which I think is really impressive overall. I mean, I'm surprised. I don't want to phrase this. I'm surprised they came back and won that game, but it's also it could be a real huge turning point. You realize that the game was Saturday. Today, today's Wednesday, which is their semifinals game. The amount of practice that they had must have been crazy with the idea that you really think about that game. Should they have really been there? But like some, when you get a second opportunity like that, that's something that can uh, be a storyline in which they could potentially win a championship all said and done. Definitely. Yeah, as soon as that goalie went down, it was a complete shift in momentum. And I think the crowd also kind of felt that as well. So like, it was, like, yet. immediate. I mean, I think it was just really impressive that uh, Zach Malka also got those two goals. Um, it's good to see that we have depth in the men's soccer group program. Um, and like what Mary said, uh, DeFalco really put in the effort, and you could really see it on the field when it comes to his defensive stops and how he handled the ball. Um, so I'm really looking forward to how the team handles Lola Chicago, especially how um, Tom Savari got the goal, the game-winning goal. Um, against Low Chicago in the regular season game. So I'm really, I think this is going to be a good test for uh, both teams, um, especially since Low Chicago knows what to expect going into uh, Rooney Field because we had a bit of a crowd um, for that game. So I just think that Low Chicago is going to be prepared, but I just want to see how Duquesne is going to be prepared for a team that knows what is going on the line and uh, knows what to expect from the environment that they're in. Yeah, I'm very excited for this game, too. I mean, it should help that they kind of know the way Loyal Chicago has played. I mean, obviously, Loyal is just going to find a way to counter, but Duquesne just needs to back that up. I mean, it's too – I'm not saying it's too bad this game is, like, tonight on a Wednesday, but I know a lot of people that got night class on Wednesdays, mm, yeah. and it's just like, if you're a professor, you should be like, yeah, like, just go, go to that game. semifinals. <laughs> I don't even remember the last time we hosted a semifinals here. This I, is, don't, I don't think we've ever. We never had a uh, home playoff wow. game in men's soccer program history. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, so that means, I guess, last year when they made that uh, deep playoff run, every single game was on the road, huh? Yeah. Yes. <sighs> yep. Man, I don't know who – if any professors are watching this, I mean – Cancel your class. I mean, it probably students. won't be posted till after, but like, if you made your kids go to class, just think to yourself, You'd be what was more important, learning about something that they could look up online in two seconds, or going to a soccer game that's potentially going to make history tonight, so. That's facts. And if, the t and if in the other semifinals matchup, if Dayton loses to St. Louis, that means we would have the, we would host the A-10 championship game on Sunday at noon, and that at was Rooney huge. Field. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. I'm going to market the crap Steelers, that. Steelers also play, and I'm a Steelers fan, but I would not be watching that game if we're at home. I'll tell you that right Who now. I mean, the Saints. New Orleans. It's going to be the most boring. Oh, Steelers yeah. barely played any boring matches. That's going to be boring. What, for free? Oh, no. Oh, oh wow. Uh, the well, fact that you my put, dad's a Saints fan. You wait, serious? Wait a minute. Wait. Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> So, so what are you wear? What are you gonna be wearing to the game then? I don't know my Mac Jones jersey. <laughs> Mac Jones jersey. <laughs> well, you have a Mac Jones jersey? Hold up. I do. Yeah. Wait, what I'm confused about is like, year. how are you an all Seattle fan, but your dad's a Saints fan? Those are two completely different parts of the. Yeah, country. how did that happen? Um. So <laughs> I, my, my first I game I watched, I think it was like it was like Seahawks Eagles, Eagles or something, or Seahawks Redskins back when they were called that, and they beat them. And I got to watch, it was the year they went to the Super Bowl, ironically. I was like four years old. And I got to watch Matt Hasselbeck and Sean Alexander. Oh, against play. my team, okay. Yeah. <laughs> when we won. Yeah. And um, my first ever video game I ever got for the Xbox 360, it was like Madden, I want to say it's Madden 06. He was on the cover. With Sean Alexander. Yeah. Was that 06 or 07? 
I'm gonna look that up. Oh six, I'm pretty sure. I got Madden twelve, and I was with that one browser. Pain house. Pain yeah. house. Pain oh, house. Oh, that's that's hilarious. That's sort of we. It's so funny. Yeah, I got out of Pain house too. Is no one. <laughs> Pain house probably has no social media at all. Like I cannot tell you like what that man's doing in his life right now. I don't now. either. That man probably just completely life. vanished off the map. Yeah, it was Madden 07. seven. Sean Alexander was on the cover. Sean Alexander was a beast too. His career. Some of these running backs like him, Barry Sanders, like careers More ended Sean way Lynch. too early. Well, that could sure be a discussion for another day though. Yeah. yeah. I think football in general is like one of those sports is just brutal when it comes to the ball body. You saw that with uh, Abdul Jane uh, against Secret Heart when he just was out on the. He's okay, you know that. Yeah, yeah I know he's fine, but like it's I, just it was funny because that was really scary. I was working so audio for the men's basketball game yesterday, and mm -hmm. I was next to Trey, and then some other football player walked up, and then was Abdul, and I looked at him, and I was like, was that actually Abdul, or is that just another player that just Looks that like just like I just never heard of before? Yeah. And I, and then once Abdul went to the court because of his internship, I was like, Trey, like, is that Abdul? He's like, yeah, I'm like, uh, but I was like, really? Yeah. He's like, yeah, he's like, he was just knocked out for a couple minutes, put him on the stretcher. He was actually okay. Passed all his concussion tests. I asked yeah. Abdul, too. He's supposed to play on Saturday, which is a really good sign. Yeah. So that coaches let him, so that's pretty good as well because he was balling before he got hit on that play. Yeah, man, that was just really crazy when I was on the field taking photos and – like seeing that we like, I just saw the med team just rush by, grab some stuff, go back into the field. It's the first yeah. time I've seen a stretcher come out too. On that yeah, field. and I was like, wow. yeah, a stretcher came out on that field. I was like, it took a while. It took like maybe like ten minutes max, but still. Yeah, it's just it's a really physical sport, and I I really want to see how football th players are like feeling about like injuries and whatnot. Yeah, we'll talk about football for sure on next week's, Definitely. if not next week's, then the following week's episode. But my last question for all of you before we wrap this up is, what do we think the final score is going to be of the Loyola Chicago Duquesne game tonight? Mary, I'll start with you. I think it'll go 2 nothing. I think, um, obviously, Duquesne winning. I think our goalie um, is due for another shutout. He hasn't had one in multiple games. So I think that might be coming for him. I also think Ask last game was kind of like non-existent. And I think he probably watched the film and saw that. So he might step up and score a goal. And I think Maxi might come up with a goal tonight too. All right, I like that too. So you're saying Ask and Maxi with goals too? I like yep. that. All right, Nick. Um, I feel like it's going to be a really boring, just tight game. I'm going to say one nothing Duquesne. He's scoring one. the goal. Uh, Give me a play. Kasha. Jacob Kasha. Jacob Kasha. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, before I have you predict, I'm going to say Shout Duquesne also wins too. I think it's going to be one nothing too. Dom's definitely due for a shutout. Yep. Give me Nate Dragosic with the goal. That's going to mm -hmm. be a good storyline tonight if he scores, though, because throughout the whole season, I mean, he's been making good passes. I mean, he's been ma he's obviously been making all these other players look good because of the, the amount of assists he ha has. The, but his ability to... Um, control the ball and able to fight off um, defenders to steal the ball from them is pretty impressive too. I was just going with Nate. I think I think it would be a good story. I think no matter how this game ends, like there's going to be a big storyline coming out of it besides us, e besides Duquesne either making the championship or not. Besides that storyline, I think something like Nate scoring a goal would be pretty um, significant. I mean, I would say that Dukes are going to win too, um, but I think it's going to be 1-0. Uh, Naskaman is due for a shutout. But I think it's going to be really close when it comes to a lot of shots getting off by Lua Chicago. Uh, he had seven saves last time, and I think it's going to be something along those lines. But I think he's going to step up his effort, especially since it's the semifinals. It's going to lead to the finals, which, by the way, I'm going to say that Dayton beats St. Louis. Oh, and I'm going to say that we are going here? to have the championship at Rooney Field on Sunday. Mark my words, camera. That would be wild if that does happen. Yeah, watch me just put it on existence. How far is St. Louis? From Miles here? away. Well, yeah, miles. <laughs> <laughs> Too far. Yeah, yeah. I think it's like at least five or six hours. I mean, I know on a draft. I know SLU is basically in the heart of St. Louis, so. If it goes St. Louis, I might have to drive and go watch the game. That's a crap. Yeah, I don't know about that, but. Uh, Pack some people in my car. <laughs> okay. Who's scoring the goal then, Peter? I'm going to say, I'm going to say something along the lines of you are, but I'm going to say Nate Dragon is just going to get the assist. But as I said to Nick, Jacob Kasher is going to get that goal. And he's quick and nimble. He knows how to get around defenders. And Nate Dragosic knows how to fend off defenders. He knows how to pass the ball to the right people at the right time. I'm going to say Jacob Kasher is going to get that goal. 
and it's going to be assisted by Nate Jokicic. We'll, s we'll see. Even, uh, I'm, I'm not going to say the minute. That's way too specific. Nah, That's no. We'll see if Tasha <laughs> scores the goal, but if he does, I mean, I, I would be surprised. Dollars. I mean, if, we, if I had a bet on which player on that team is probably the fastest, it, I really do feel it would be like um, yeah, it'll probably be Kasha. Kasha, Dragosic, or Hopper, all three, definitely yep. top three in my opinion. If you told me someone like, I don't know, like I mean, a def if a defender w it would be the quickest, I'd be kind of shocked. But I, I mean, Christopher but, Angel was pretty dope. Like, he can move. I think his agility is good. I don't, I'm not sure about how fast he could. I'm talking yeah. about, we're talking about like a 100 meter Speed, dash. Like yeah. 40 meter. Okay. Yeah. I feel yeah. like one of those three that I said could be definitely up there. Yeah. But someone who's, I think, just really mentally good, just knows like where on the field to pass the ball is Jesper, and that's why he's Ooh. playing defense. Like, yep. He can pass the ball. He doesn't. How do, how do I want to describe about the way Jesper plays? He's he always plays defense, but there's a lot of times he can, like... He can pass. He, he can, can pass. He can... He, sometimes he plays offense yeah. as a forward, too, and then he runs back. Like, a couple of games I announced and um, filmed, I, like, saw that, and I was like... Mm. I'm not... Uh, like, this, they could actually use him in more ways than I think, like, they even know. I'm not a soccer coach or anything. You know, give me <laughs> but I feel like they could really use Jesper in, like, a whole lot of new, different ways. I mean, he's a, a kid from... Not a kid from Virginia, but he played he for played Virginia, Virginia last year. He's from Norway? I, mean, I don't know. He's got to be from Norway. If you want to look that up real quick. But it, he's just he's just someone that I feel like once uh, Coach Brooks like watches his whole film, mm -hmm. no matter how the season ends, he's got to think to himself that he could use him and like put him in different spots on the field and use him more effectively than he already is. So. And by the way, yes, J uh, Jesper is from Norway. Jesper's from Norway. Yeah. That's how it ended. So... For everyone here, for Nick, Mary, and Peter, I'm Brent Terry. You've been watching another episode of the Press Box. Thank you all for watching and listening. We appreciate you, and we hope, we hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. And go Dukes. Go Dukes.